Thank you. The only person I think we're waiting for is Pernell, but because I understand, um, I think we've got a couple, couple committee members that um, may need to pop in and out. Um, so with that, I wait. Give per. I, I, I think we should go mm -hmm. ahead and get started because um, we've got a lot to cover too with Case being on the call. So with that said, I'm gonna call to order the Human Resources Appointment and Equity Committee meeting. Today is Tuesday, November 17th. Council Clerk, will you please call the roll? Call the roll, Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones is absent at the moment. Mr. Miller? Here. Conwell? Here. Here's the quorum. All right, thank you. Um, was there any public comment? No, Madam Chair, no one submitted any public comment. All right, I will make the motion to approve the minutes from the October 20th, 2020 meeting. Do I have a second? Miller, second. Seconded by Miller. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? All right, the meetings are, the meeting minutes from October 20th are approved. Um, Council Clerk, if you read the first item into the record, please. Resolution, resolution number 2020-0224, confirm the county executive's appointment of various individuals to serve on the Cuyahoga Regional HIV Health Services Planning Council for the term October 28, 2020 to October 27, 2023. All right, good morning, Director Pomerantz. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, good morning. Uh, this item is a um, completion of an earlier resolution that we passed at the last um, committee meeting and just wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to speak to uh, two of our other um, applicants. So this is um, the county executive's appointment to individuals to serve on the Cuyahoga Regional HIV Health Services Planning Council for a term beginning 10 28 2020 until 10 27 2023 and i believe that um, melissa rodrigo from the um, cuyahoga board of health as well as the two candidates tracy lamar johnson and leander lovett are here today to speak to their qualifications and hopefully um, get the approval to serve on this board all right thank you very much director uh, are there any questions for director pomerantz from the committee all right, um, if there are none, then we will move to uh, speak to Tracy Lamar Johnson. Uh, if you will unmute yourself, give us a little bit of your background and share why you would like to uh, be part of this uh, body. Good morning, how's everyone doing? Morning. Uh, so a little about myself, I've been living with HIV for 15 years. Um, in those 15 years, I have been a international advocate, been featured in Pause magazines and other magazines and news articles. Um, I am 32 years old. Um, I have sat on the planning council before, so it's good to be back as a young person with a lot of energy and fresh ideas. So that's a little about me. All right. So you said you you sat on the council before, and you so you are you are returning, but this is not a, a continuum of a reappointment. So what what do you think you'll bring to this body now that um, that was different from the first time that you served? Um, I think as a young person, I bring that it is possible for other young people that you the knowledge, um, wisdom, time commitment compassion and just been a voice for the voiceless. Okay. And then how did you um, learn about the opening the second time? They had a regional forum um, about a year and a half ago that I attended because mm -hmm. I had children. So I took time away for, um, after I left the HIV field uh, for a while with having children. So all right, I'll open it up to my colleagues if you have any um, additional questions, council members, going once, going twice. All right, uh, 
Mr. Tracy Lamar Johnson. Looks like you've got off pretty easy this morning. So uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for your willingness to serve in this capacity. And um, if there are no further questions, we're going to see if our next candidate is present. Uh, Leander Lovett, director, is Leander on the call or available? Um, I thought Leander was um, gonna be able to join us. I don't see their name. Um, Melissa, are you, are you on? Michelle, I'm, I'm here. Um, I don't see Leander joining us as well. We did talk to him this morning. He did say he was going to be on the call. So I'm not sure if he's having audio issues. We, we did just, just try to reach him again. Um, and we cannot get a hold of him. Okay. So with that said, we will, we'll just hold on, hold off on, um, moving forward with this item. We'll, we'll circle back if necessary, if he comes back on the call then we'll um, revisit the item. If not, what we'll likely do is just amend it to um, move uh, Tracy Lamar Johnson forward. And the reason being just for those who are in the audience or viewing is that we, we think it's important that our um, the public is able to identify the individuals who are serving in these capacity, uh, these capacities for board appointments and council appointments. So um, especially where it relates to new appointments, we wanna be able to gauge their interests, put names with faces and learn a little bit about their experiences. So um, with that said, I'm just gonna hold off and move on to item B. Council Clerk, we read that item into the record, please. And for the record, uh, Councilman Jones has joined the meeting. Thank you. Council Clerk. Resolution number 2020-0246, making an award on requisition number 4056 with the Cleveland Foundation, serving as fiscal agent on behalf of the bail project in the amount not to exceed $200,000 to support the organization's mission activities by providing financial assistance to pay court bail and related support services to low-income inmates for the period November 1st, 2020 to, December, to October 31st, 2021. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit out of order, and um, who's here to speak to that item? Uh, that would be uh, Public Safety Chief Bob Corey. Okay, Chief, you have the floor. Please thank you and give us a little bit of background here. So the the Bell Project uh, Cleveland started in August of 2019. Uh, the mission, their mission, and the mission of this project and the thrust of this contract is uh, to provide bail and provide assistance for low income people uh, so that they can get out of jail. So they cannot afford to post their bond. A bond has been posted. A judge has deemed them eligible to be uh, join the community pending their uh, trial or disposition hearing. And uh, they cannot post bond for financial reasons. So in addition to posting the bond for them through over evolving line of credit through the National Bail Project, which has a fund they meet with the clients, they remind the clients about upcoming court dates, and they even coordinate transportation uh, when necessary. Further, they refer clients to for necessary services to support them upon release. So the Bail Project Cleveland is part of the uh, national organization that has 25 offices uh, around the country. They started in August of 2019, as I said, and during a 12 month period going back to August of this year, They've so far posted bail for 20, 221 low-income people. Um, the, this, this term, which we would provide them $200,000 to, uh, so their funding does not run out, uh, we would provide that funding to the Friends of the Bail Project uh, together. And I think we submitted that those documentation to you. They have raised other mon uh, money, including uh, donations from the Cleveland Foundation, who is supporting uh, their organization. So we would provide this money for the next 12 months. And the primary goal of the project uh, further supports that they would continue to provide and post court bail. Uh, they would help do the um, compliance so that uh, these individuals who have posted bond comply with all the bail terms, including, for example, no contact orders, et cetera, et cetera. And they would remind clients uh, system, system, systematically about their upcoming court dates and coordinate transportation as needed. Um, again, they would do the, hook them up with wraparound services and housing services as necessary. As part of the contract, um, we decided that 
while we have their data, uh, we made part of the contract that they would provide us not only demographic information on those that they post bond, including age, sex, and race, ethnicity. Uh, we wanted the primary charge type uh, in the court of record because they post bonds uh, for in common pleas as well as municipal, municipal court, Cleveland Muni many times. And we want the, the bond type, the bond amount, if there are any bond revocations, so we could see uh, for those inmates where they had a, uh, a bad result, i.e. the inmate did not uh, come up for a court hearing and a capius was issued, we wanna see their bond revocations and then court case dispositions, how the case was resolved. Uh, but there's a, an additional, and that's what took a while in the contract. We also decided that we needed information about those individuals for which they didn't, for whom they did not post bond. So they're also going to give us the same kind of data uh, after they did their review, their interviews, and made a determination that, that these individuals, the individuals they interviewed, were not eligible for bond. We want to see that. Um, we want to see that population of individuals. Why do we want to see that? So we get the total body uh, and picture of the work that they're doing from those that they posted bond for, as well as those that they, uh, under their criteria, did not post bond for. And we can make a determination collectively whether or not there is a, an additional uh, gap in services. What was the reason that they did not post the bond? Uh, was it because uh, the amount of money they had available to post bond you know, was too high? The, because right now, I think the average bond, I'm gonna turn to my right for my other documents. The, the median bail they post is $500. So they have a cap on how much they can afford to post for an individual person. So did they not post bond because it exceeded the amount? Did they not post bond because the person did not have good address? Uh, one of their uh, other requirements is that they be able to contact them. Did they not have contact information? So with a picture into that, not only can we determine uh, and measure uh, the output of the program, but we can determine whether or not there are gaps for additional services maybe. Um, with that, um, I could pause for questions at this time or I can keep going with other information. No, I, I, um, I appreciate the, the, um, the background there and I do have a couple of questions, um, but I'll pause as it looks like Councilman Miller may have a question. Councilman Miller. Hi. Uh... Do not have a question, but I have a comment. Uh, just that I uh, consider this to be a really important work, and and uh, uh, I I strongly support the bail project. I would I would also add that uh, I see it as an interim step. Uh, we should be moving toward the elimination of cash bail, mm -hmm. uh, whether a person stays in jail waiting their trial or, or whether they get to be released shouldn't be a matter of how much money they have. It, it should be a matter of whether they're uh, uh, a low risk to commit further crimes and whether they're uh, highly probable to return for their hearings. Uh, yesterday, Crystal Bryant testified that, that 18,000 people cycled in and out of the county jail in, in, uh, in a year, producing uh, a very high number of people that, uh, that need re-entry services. We shouldn't have uh, thousands of people sitting in jail waiting for their trials. It, it, uh, it costs them their jobs, it disrupts their lives, and, and it, uh, it makes their prospects for turning their lives around worse. So uh, I, uh, I strongly support this measure as, uh, as an interim step, but I think there's uh, a huge amount of much stronger actions that we need to take to uh, create a more equitable and just uh, criminal justice system. Thank you. Councilman Miller, any other comments or questions from my colleagues? Or Councilman uh, Jones? Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, and my, my comments question as well is they're along the same lines as Councilman Miller. I, I just go back and I think about uh, how at our height, the county jail had roughly 2,500 individuals. 
And as a result of COVID, we were able to get that number just under a thousand at, at its lowest point. And that is because the criminal justice system collectively came together and said, what can we do? So despite all the years of advocacy and lobbying by, by proponents for, for criminal justice reform, the system got together and figured out what they needed to do. And, and I, we commended them for what they did. My hope is that what they did be laid bare. We all know exactly what tools that they use. They, they didn't endanger the community. They didn't put individuals out that were a threat. They, they found a way to do it successfully. My question ultimately to you is, as I, I look at this legislation, do you have any insight into what they, um, what they did in terms of bail reform? Um, was this piece of legislation that you're asking, asking for now, was this something that was done over that time period? Um, is this a new component to what they did to, to uh, again, reduce the jail population? C can you give us any insight? Well, I, I'll answer uh, all those questions and they're great questions. And the first question is with regard to the bail project. So as part of the effort to reduce the jail population, as it relates to the bail project, we didn't do a lot because we couldn't do a lot uh, other than support their access to the jail, right? So Anthony Body, who I've worked with, he's one of the, uh, the in the Cleveland office, um, has to get access to the jail and, and jail personnel so that he can do interviews, et cetera, to get folks out of the jail. So one of the things I facilitated was better access for him. Two, um, we, we worked with the bail project over a period of about 60 days to come up with a report that we developed out of um, our jail system, um, IMAX, to provide them data on um, all the people that are released on a daily basis. We call it the two street rep report. So we since, um, I'll tell you, since uh, I think, yes, the beginning of June, uh, we provided, we created the report, you know, cause you know, we had to get into the system and it's not just easy to just create a report. It's not manual, it's automated. So every day I personally sent to Anthony Body uh, our two street report so he could see everybody that's been released so that they can proactively reach out to individuals um, uh, for wraparound services so that, or, or follow-up services to make sure that they maintain bond. Because this is a two street report. So this is an additional service that the bail project wants to provide is that even for folks that they didn't post bond for, they wanna keep them on the street. So those were limited uh, support that we provided to the bail project. Uh, nevertheless, it was related to your question of one of the things that we did to keep people out of the jail. Uh, what we had done recently is we created a list of, of things that we had done to reduce the jail population. And on that list, we said, this is sustainable, this is not sustainable. And uh, on the sustainable list are video court hearings so that we can have more prompt hearings, um, continue to encourage common police court and municipal court, which really needed, the uh, judge really needs no um, encouragement uh, for reasonable bonds. Uh, faster uh, scheduling of probation violation hearings so that as soon as uh, someone's picked up on a KPS for a probation violation, they immediately get a hearing because, we, you know, the system was lackadaisical about how fast we responded to those things. Um, there, um, oh, uh, he, uh, as part of the, um, as part of the video court hearings, um, uh, better connectivity of data between the court system and our new system X jail so that the court can be advised more quickly when somebody's brought into the jail so that they can be, uh, so they can prompt their interactions for pretrial diversion programs for interviews, et cetera. Uh, in part with that, what we did was we increased their ability to use the securest video for, uh, their pretrial assessment interviews. The faster they can get those interviews done, the faster that they can be assessed for, for bond reductions. But there were many things that, that reduced the jail population that are on the unsustainable list. Um, the Michael Malley, Prosecutor O'Malley, suspended a grand jury uh, for low-level felons. Uh, the court suspended all probation violations. Uh, they terminated and did not have any bail um, 
So if there were bail arraignments, they suspended bail arraignments. Uh, the court suspended uh, <clears throat> also uh, for low level felons. Uh, they didn't do any capuses for failure to appear. So those, those things that helped us also reduce the jail population were in the unsustainable list. But there were plenty of things like, you know, rational bond, uh, court video hearings, uh, facilitate faster interviews for pretrial services that can support bonds that we have determined are sustainable and we're gonna continue to do that. The last, quite, last point on this is that we, we, can, we still meet every Monday at 1.30, all the stakeholders, including the administrative judge, myself, Bill Mason, um, and Michelle, Judge Michelle Early, Municipal Court, to continue to work that list for who we can provide uh, rational bonds to, who are awaiting uh, probation violation hearings so that they could timely get their day in court uh, to be either sent on their way or, or violated. And, uh, you know, if a sentence needs to be imposed, then so be it. Uh, so we continue to do that. Uh, and then since the escalation of the community spread of coronavirus, uh, we've, we've, we put a fire under it because we started to slip back up, Councilman, to the above 1500 range. We're back down to, uh, I think, 1470 today. Uh, and it's because of some of the, because we lit a fire under ourselves given the crisis. I agree with you uh, and I agree with Councilman Miller that we have to do more for rational uh, bail. When the Supreme Court um, updated the criminal rule 46 in the beginning of the year, they didn't go far enough for our common police court. Um, and when they said in their section that considerations for bail, I'm just sliding this over here. If the court orders financial conditions of release, those financial conditions shall be related to the defendant's risk of non-appearance, the seriousness of the offense and the previous criminal record of the defendant. Uh, some of the, the courts, uh, you know, feel that they have to take into account uh, the seriousness of the offense, not only um, their likeliness to appear, and this, and together with the previous criminal record of the defendant. So even even if the otherwise, you know, they have housing, um, they might overweight the previous criminal record of the defendant. And then they cite criminal rule 46B, which says that they're required to look at that. So I, I still think that there's enough discretion in here to be more rational with bonds. And we're gonna, con we're gonna continue to encourage them to do so. Um, Judge Early has been a big advocate of that, as you know, also. Uh, I thank you for that. That was thorough. I, I really appreciate that. Um, when you mentioned the sustainable items and the things that were not sustainable, if, from your perspective, where do you think we're headed? Do you think there's going to be a slow creep back to those numbers above the, the actual jail capacity? Or do you think they're, they've incorporated enough sustainable items or, or you know, using those tools to, to keep this uh, jail population within what the building was designed to hold? I'm gonna say we cannot afford to lose the momentum. Uh, call, call it which word, momentum, this, this collaborative spirit that you pointed out. We cannot afford to lose that. Uh, two things that I think are going to help with that uh, are the fact that we've got this, this formalized network of communication and planning together. Um, excited about the diversion center that um, looks like we're get, it's getting more concrete in terms of um, you know, the agreements and a plan now for implementation. Uh, with that, we're, gonna, we're going to have the opportunity to make sure that we catch folks before they even get to the jailhouse doors, right? They, who otherwise committed a crime and would have been in the jail, even if they would have been processed within 72 hours and got a bond quick because Judge Early's all over it they shouldn't be there in the first place because of serious mental illness or, or drug dependency, right? So that diversion. And then the implementation of centralized booking, which requires all the folks coming together when an inmate hits the jail. So these are post-arrest 
You know, they got through the diversion net, maybe because the seriousness of the crime, maybe because they need to be pushed out back to diversion. In any event, they got to the jail. We've got to continue to work with the common police court to support their pretrial services effort on the model of the Cleveland Municipal Court, where pretrial services is right there, working with the booking sergeant, the uh, county prosecutors on site, the public defenders on site, and all three of those folks are right on site talking about whether or not this is really a felony. Is this a misdemeanor? If this is a felony, uh, can we post a bond that day? Because we were able to do pretrial services interview right there, expediting the process as well as, you know, um, improving, uh, improving it because you have access to all the info, all the folks, all the decision makers have access to information right there. So I think those two big things, diversion, central booking, three things, and what we have put together so far, this collaborative effort, you said it just due to COVID, um, uh, are going to provide us the impetus we need to do this. So I don't think we can afford to fail. Okay. I, I, I can't help but think also about the point you just made about the judges. Um, make sure I give it back to you the way the way you said it, or at least the way I heard it. You said they would cite a court hearing or, or a piece of legislation where they would um, either withhold bail because of of the the crime committed. I don't know if I... Yeah, if I it's uh, it Rule 46, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just read because I, okay. I refresh myself in preparation for this. So it's not like I had it all up here. So it's rule 46B, pretrial release. And um, so it says, let me just read one sentence before. Mm -hmm. The court shall release the defendant on the least restrictive conditions. So that, this was the new language the Supreme Court added in, in furtherance of bail reform. The court shall release the defendant on the least restrictive conditions that, in the discretion of the court, will reasonably assure the defendant's appearance in court. The, and then they add, so you're supposed to do the least restrictive method necessary to, one, uh, assure the defendant's appearance in court. And they add protection or safety of any person of the community and that the defendant will not obstruct the criminal justice process. If the court does order financial conditions of release, those conditions shall be related to, I'm um, putting the one in, one, the defendant's risk of non-appearance. So take into account their likelihood to appear and then adjust your amount accordingly. The seriousness of the offense from you know homicide to criminal trespassing. And then the previous criminal record of the defendant, which is, which is um, self-explanatory. So they're supposed to make all those considerations. Now, it doesn't give them like a, uh, a mathematical paradigm to insert these things and come up with a formula. So there's discretion to consider in a judge's, um, in a judge's own opinion what their risk of non-appearance is. Um, how much of a threat they are to the community or a victim, let's say if it's a domestic violence. So it's maybe through the eye of the beholder and a question of philosophy. Uh, but if the emphasis is on appearance, court appearance, and you were going to post a bond anyway, you made a determination that they can be released. Uh, right. It does seem difficult to say, well, had they had enough money, they could have been they could have been free. So it's, that's one of the benefits of having folks like the bail project and why we're, why we're supporting them. And we hope that you do is because the difference between release and not release in this, many of these cases, is just whether you got the money to do it. Right. Right. So th that's what I heard as councilman Miller said earlier, the, the two reasons that, and what I heard in your reading was that, are you a flight risk and are you a threat to the community? Uh, if those are, if the law says those are the two reasons, um, as you mentioned, the eye of the beholder, are they, are they seeing more? Are they, are they using something beyond that as the criteria? And, and is that right, if that's the case? Uh, so uh, a robust pretrial services program uh, that can then support, make a bail recommendation is very important in that regard and making sure that, that, um, that, 
that the discretion is focused on those important factors you just outlined. Thank you, I realize the of the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so Chief, the, the question that comes to mind is those tools are available. Are we not implementing or utilizing those tools across the board? And additionally, you emphasized a uh, judge early is, is Judge Sheehan not a part of this project? Is it strictly uh, relegated to Cleveland? No, 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 he, he absolutely is. Um, he absolutely is. And uh, he, he was also interviewed by um, the, uh, the equity, the case folks. And I've talked, we, we talk almost every day. He's absolutely committed to it. Uh, now we're down to, you know, what are the, what, are, what do they think they need for additional resources to bolster pretrial services program? Um, I know folks, uh, some folks aren't happy with, um, for example, ankle bracelets as, as part of um, a step to, to get folks out of the jail because they view that as another form of incarceration. But they've been a very good advocate of looking at getting them out of the jail, back into the community, uh, with additional ankle bracelets. They have paid for additional funding for that. And the next step, I think, for, for Common Police Court pretrial services is for us to get budgetary requirements from them. Um, uh, Brandy Carney, uh, also you know, managing the opioid funding uh, before I got here, uh, set aside a year's support for additional pretrial services uh, funding. The difficulty with implementing that was um, in order to hire folks, uh, it's difficult to hire folks with just a one year funding. So we're looking at what we need to do to sustain that so that if they do invest in this, it's not just some one off one year th program thing that's gone the next year. It's sustainable. Uh, it's consistent with something like uh, the Arnold tools that uh, Judge Early and their pretrial services are, are using. It doesn't have to be Arnold. It doesn't have to be Arnold, but you know some other assessment mechanism. Uh, but nevertheless, that will require additional resources. Uh, in talking, me talking to Greg Popovich, uh, Judge Sheehan, it will require additional resources. The next step is for them to outline what those resources are, so that it can be considered by um, the executive and, and county council. Okay, and then the other thing um, that has been a, um, a great concern for me, and, and I know that we touched on this a little bit when you, when you first came on board, is a, comp a compilation of the demographics of the people in jail and the crimes that they've committed. Do, do we have that? Is that, a, is that something that we, um, that we have readily available? Oh, um um, regularly. Could, could, you say, could you say that composition again? And I'll see if right now I could refer to it or, or is so, it something we need to develop? I, I'm not sure. It's something I, that I certainly have requested in the past. So I'm interested in knowing the demographics of the population of those who are in our jail, as well as the, um, the, the crimes that they have committed and the time, um, the amount of time they've been you know, in there basically is what I would like to know. I think that um, that gives us a very clear picture um, about what's happening in our jails. Okay. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I will uh, commit to, I will commit to either obtaining that for, you know, frankly for myself mm -hmm. as well as you. And if not, then than putting that together. Yeah, because one of the things that we hear Absolutely. in the community is the amount of time that it takes for someone um, to, to potentially be processed uh, from time to time. And I know it's a multi-layer problem and this is a discussion that we could have um, probably longer than the a lot of time for this committee meeting. So um, I won't be labor, I won't be labor these things because the the crux of this legislation is, is very positive, but clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done around this subject of bail reform. So um, if you would be so kind as to provide that information for us in the future, I will, um, I will leave my questions there for your uh, future 
um, presentation. And I'm sure this is something that could also be heard in, uh, in uh, Councilman Gallagher's uh, public safety if it hasn't already been addressed. But I do appreciate this matter coming before this committee because as, as a chair of, e of equity, essentially human resource appointment and equity, it is an equity issue. And um, it, deserves, it deserves much greater and lengthier discussion, but we just do not have that um, luxury of time today, unfortunately. So with that said, Madam I'm, Chair. Madam uh, Chair. See, I have two of my colleagues, Councilman Miller and then Councilman Jones. Madam Chair, I will be brief, but I just really want to add one additional thing, which is that we're in the process of uh, determining what the plans are for the next jail. And uh, it, is, it is just very important that we uh, demonstrate the ability to effectively do this, this diversion and, and these programs to keep people out of jail so that, so that we don't end up building more new cells than we need to. It, it, uh, even, even 10 additional cells ends up being millions of dollars that we could otherwise spend on uh, on workforce development, mental health, and and other things that that improve people's lives, and and so it's it's very important that we uh, effectively demonstrate what we can achieve, so that we can uh, make an effective and responsible decision about what the next jail is going to look like, and that decision, the final decision, has to be made over the next year or two as we move toward construction. So, uh, so that's all I have. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Miller, Councilman Jones. Thank you. Um, first, let me say, I, I totally agree with Councilman Miller. We have to be very clear eyed on what is sustainable uh, in this new system. Uh, and it's gonna determine how, how big of a facility we, we build, what type of monstrosity of a building or, or if something is gonna be right sized for the needs of this community. Uh, so I agree with Councilman Miller. Uh, my, my question though is, uh, with this $200,000, how many individuals do you think we will be able to help um, as a result of this money? Well, we're targeting, um, the, as I mentioned, I'm gonna pull this in front of me here. So I'm looking at you while I'm looking at my documents. Uh, so they, the, during a 12 month period starting in August, and again, they just started in August, so they were slow to start up they posted uh, bail for 221 clients. Uh, just some of the information about those clients. Uh, and this is according to their data. As part of the contract requirement, they're going to be required to provide us the data. So um, three, qu uh, three quarters were male, 84% um, were African-American. The median bail was $500, but they have a limit of a maximum of $7,500, you know, because they could do 10% of $7,500 for which they can post bond. Um, additional information as of June though, was um, the average bail amount was moved up to $1,120. And the goal of the jail, of the, their goal is to provide community release and support for at least 420 uh, residents annually. So the goal is to double the output. So if we do that, we're getting a bang for our buck. Uh, and again, we're, we're not the only ones contributing. Uh, Cleveland Foundation and other Friends of the Bail Project are contributing. So I think, I think it's a, uh, a bold goal that they have, but hey, that's great. And, and last, the $33,400 of CARES Act dollars, I, I believe they have to be spent by December. Uh, is that doable? Uh, it is. It is. And that's, the, that's why it's so low, because uh, we made the, the, from, uh, breathe, Bob, uh, from the legal opinion that we got from Greg Hughes' department, as well as Catherine, uh, I had anticipated being able to pay for the entire amount out of the CARES fund or, or requesting that we do that because this directly impacts, it directly impacts jail population, which directly impacts the safety of our inmates because we've had as many as 
at one time 60 inmates with COVID. COVID. It is a congregate uh, facility, and those are the most dangerous. And we have a sicker population by far than, than the general community. So it was an easy CARES call. But what the opinion was is that you can only um, charge to CARES those amount of services that in, you anticipate to be completed uh, during the during this through December 31st. So we were conservative with the amount, not liberal, just because we don't want to have any audit problems. Thank you. All right, if there are no further questions from the committee, thank you, Chief. Um, I'd like to move this resolution, resolution to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All right, it's been moved and second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Oppose us to move to the full body of the council. Thank you, Chief. Thank um, you. Looks like uh, Mr. Leander Lovett has joined us. Well, semi, I, I don't know if he can hear us, but I do know his camera is on and he looked like he had a, a companion with him. So he may be uh, tending to his companion. So I'm still going to, we know he's here. So with that, we're going to move back uh, to item B until Mr. Uh, Lovett comes on the screen. So- uh, Madam, Madam Chair? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, just an aside, at one o'clock today, we'll be having an update on the Diversion Center itself. Oh. Uh, so if anybody's interested, they can jump into that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Gallagher. All right, uh, Council- Oh, Mr. Lovett is back. <laughs> Just in the nick of time. All right. So, uh, Director Pomerantz already gave us an overview. Uh, Ms. Addison, I thank you for your patience. And, and Mr. Taylor, too, we'll be circling back to you, Ms. Addison. As for now, Mr. Uh, Love it. You are on. You, um, if you'll unmute yourself and give us a little bit of your background and share with us why it is that you would like to serve on the Cuyahoga Regional HIV Health Services Planning Council. We need you to unmute. All right, there you go. Good morning, y'all. Sorry. Good morning. Uh, um, no I'm, apologies, the floor is yours. I'm, I'm late and, and all this stuff, but uh, uh, I've been having my grandson with me for the week because his mother had surgery, so I got him. Um, but anyway, um, I'm um, 57 years old, I'm uh, a person that's been living with HIV since 1992. Um, I'm a uh, U.S. Army veteran, and also um, I done had my multiple stints in the county jail. So uh, the reason why I want to be on the committee is because um, them problems, you know, being in the county jail and stuff like that, it, it, it was awful for people like us. But um, anyway, I want to be able to do my part, you know, be able to reach out to people, be able to uh, get them information that I already know and attain because of my condition and stuff. I'm really on top of, you know, what's wrong with, you, you know, what um, my uh, labs and stuff are. Um, I share whatever information I have with, uh, my other peers that um, uh, uh, may be stricken with, you know, the disease that I have. But uh, one thing for certain, two things for sure. Uh, today I know how to live with it, and I don't let it, you know, define my life today. Um, basically, um, I just want to feel like I'm doing something for uh, my community. I want to feel like I'm doing something for my people, and. Um, I want my, you know, grandchildren just to be proud of me, you know, when they find out what I've done. And that's all I have. Well, that that is plenty. First and foremost, thank you for your service. Um, I don't know that we give our veterans enough of the tools that they need when they return. And um, it sounds like that might be evident in your story. And I might be being a little presumptuous there, but um, I, uh, I also, think that your, um, your drive and your ambition and your desire to leave a legacy 
um, for your uh, for your family, particularly your grandchildren, to be proud of is is quite noble, and um, and I and I commend you for that personally. So um, I will open it up to my colleagues if you have any questions. Uh, any questions? Well, you know what? It sounds like going once, going twice. It sounds like you got not very easy today, Mr. Lovett. We thank you for making the time today, especially given the, given the responsibilities. We know that COVID has placed a, a tremendous amount of challenges in our path as we uh, deal with working from home and having children in the home while we're trying to work and all of those, uh, all of those things that, that have uh, forced us to find a new way of normal and even um, this virtual meeting today. So with that said, I won't belabor the point. I, I think uh, just the, the brief overview that you share with us and your desire to serve is certainly uh, worthy of your appointment. And um, so with that, I will make the motion to move this to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Second. It's been second. seconded by Councilman Miller. If there are no additional questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, there are none opposed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lovett. This will move to the full body of the council at our next council meeting. Please, um, I understand if you have to if you have to depart, if you have to part ways, we, we, we certainly uh, understand, but we thank you again for your willingness to serve and the service that you've already um, provided to our, uh, to our, to our country, as, country as, your, as a veteran. And happy belated Veterans Day. All right, thank you very much, y'all. Thank, thank everybody for for, for your votes. Thank you. Very well. You're welcome. All right, Council Clerk, if you'll read the next item into the record. Um, well, the item B, please. Resolution number 2020-0225, confirming, confirming the county executive's appointment of Bashira Addison to serve on the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board of Cuyahoga County for the term July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2024. Director Pomerantz, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am pleased today to nominate the following uh, for appointment to the Cuyahoga County Alcohol, Drug Addiction and Mental Health Services Board, Bashara Addison for a four year term replacing Megan Van Voorhees. Uh, the Adams Board is uh, consists of 18 members, 10 of whom are appointed by the executive subject to council confirmation and eight of whom are appointed by the Ohio Department of Alcohol and Drug Addiction Services. The Adams Board mission is to promote and enhance the quality of life of Cuyahoga County residents through a commitment to excellence in mental health, alcohol, drug, and other addiction services. I believe the candidate Bashar Addison, as well as the Adams Board um, Executive um, Assistant Linda Lamp are here today to help support and answer any questions you or your committee may have. All right, I'll open it up to the committee for any questions for Director Pomerantz with regards to the body. If there are none, Ms. Addison, welcome. Please state your name for the record and give us a little bit of your background and why you'd like to serve in this capacity. Sure, uh, my name is Bashara Addison and um, I operate at the intersection of workforce development and criminal justice reform. I think many of you know me as a, a big reentry champion. Um, I think it was Nina Turner who used to, Senator Nina Turner, who used to uh, say that I was, uh, I was definitely the reentry girl in the room. And uh, I would say that I have two, I, have, I wanna separate my response into two buckets. First, uh, my interest in the committee and also my professional expertise that I believe I can add value. Uh, first, my interest, uh, I am first and foremost and always will be an advocate. And I work for Towards Employment, which is a workforce development agency that serves um, young adults, adults with criminal records, um, and individuals who are 200% below the federal poverty level looking to seek careers in manufacturing, healthcare, IT, culinary, and a couple others. Uh, but we have a heavy emphasis on reentry. Um, I would say about two thirds of the individuals we serve on any given year have criminal records. And as I've done work around policy and advocacy to reduce barriers to employment, for these individuals, one of the data points that is loud and clear is that about a third of those that we serve that have records, so that's about 100 individuals on any given year, cite um, addiction as one of their barriers to employment. And uh, I want to make a distinction. 
we have we did a, an overlapping analysis of individuals who are coming to us uh, where drug possession is their most serious offense. So uh, we have about 100 of those individuals, but only 30 overlapped with individuals that were coming to us for employment services where they cited addiction as their um, barrier to employment. So that means about between 60 to 70 individuals did not have a drug related offense on their record, but still saw addiction as a barrier to employment. So in understanding our data, I know how important uh, the Adams Board is for our community and for those that my agency serves. On a personal note, um, my brother battles um, substance abuse and um, addiction, uh, particularly, it, it, I always say substance abuse because alcohol is his drug of choice right now. But um, in the last 17 years, it's been a number of different substances. So I know how mental health and addiction can impact families and how no matter how, what kind of privilege you have, no matter what race you are, um, addiction can still be a hindrance uh, for a family. I grew up in a lot of privilege. I grew up in Shaker Heights and my parents did everything right. And we you know, struggle every day with how we best support him. And then I also grew up around mental health and addiction because my aunt was the former CEO to Murtis Taylor. And so I helped um, uh, wrap uh, you know, tchotchkes for her annual events. Um, she would create summer internships for me. So I, I grew up at Murtis Taylor. And so this, the body of work of the Adams Board is at my heart. In terms of professional expertise, as a public policy professional, I'm very familiar with the way that government and practice um, intersect and how important funding is as a linkage between those two things. And I believe that the Adams Board operates at the intersection of government policy, but also funding the providers who deliver services to our, to our county's residents. And so that understanding, I believe, will be helpful in terms of being able to understand the budgets and all the different things that um, the Adams Board um, has to manage. So both professionally and personally, um, I hope that you will uh, consider me as uh, someone that could be an excellent addition to the Adams Board. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think that um, I have had the privilege of, uh, you, you did a tour for us, uh, you and Crystal, that we uh, many of us participated in a couple of years ago, and that was very eye-opening. So the work that you, that you do, I find invaluable. And, and to hear your personal story only um, adds to my level of respect for you. Um, so I don't have any questions. As I said, I've had the privilege of witnessing your work um, in many in many environments that we uh, overlap with that. So with that, I will open it up to my colleagues if they have any questions or comments that they would like to make. And it looks like Councilman Jones is unmuted. So I'll go to you first, Councilman Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I feel the same way. I, I, um, Bashar, we've known each other over the 10 years that I've been in council and uh, you are highly respected by me as well as many others. I, I know what you bring to the table and, and your commitment, your passion. And, and it was an honor just to, just to hear your story. We, we listened to many of, of these presentations. Um, that was one of the more touching for me. So I, so I thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna take this opportunity and knowing the skill set you have, um, I, I'm curious as to what our local faith community can do to um, to help battle this uh, issue of addiction, uh, the opiate crisis, all of those things. D do you have any thoughts on how the, the faith community could could better plug in and partner and find ways to help? Have, have you ever given that any thought or consideration? So my understanding, which if I'm added to the Adams board, I think I'd be able to deepen that understanding, um, better understanding how some of the money flows. But I believe that the faith community is already pretty involved in that space because so many um, churches um, hold um, AA meetings. So uh, the church that I grew up in, um, my parents' church, Antioch Baptist Church, um, holds AA meetings. Um, and then there was um, a church in Cuyahoga County, but kind of definitely in like the east side suburbs um, that my brother went to AA meetings. So my experience with AA is that uh, my brother's always been served. And then I know that my, my 
parents church has served individuals who are struggling from alcoholism um, in a church setting. I think that there's certainly a role to play and I'm, I'm a firm believer and as a public policy professional that everyone has a role in the ecosystem. Um, so, you know, you always, you might have someone that does the education then you might have someone that's a closer and those are two different people. I think the faith community has a role to play because faith and uh, being able to overcome severe challenges is, the, they go hand in hand. If you don't have something to believe in, then I think it's, then it's hard to have hope that you can overcome a problem. And so I think there's a deep intersection. I don't think that uh, we should have a one size fits all approach. Uh, my brother and I grew up in a very religious home for those of you who do know my parents. Uh, parents are very, very active religiously. Uh, they're Baptists. Uh, they go to Antioch and I go to Olivet. So they're active actually at both since now that I go to Olivet. And uh, my brother is not, however. So you can imagine my brother expressing to my parents as a child that he has a different kind of affiliation, which is super different how that was received. And I find that he is not served well in the faith community because it, it, he doesn't align with it. And it's part of his own, um, almost like resistance to my father. So my father's so religious, so he's like totally, and because the, the addiction, his addiction related issues have created a chasm between the two of them. He rejects um, those kinds of services from a faith lens. So I think it's important for some people, but I think there also has to be other options. But I'm a firm believer that we should be resourcing um, the faith community to deliver those services because they do help a certain swath of individuals. Um, and I think it's because if you're trying to, particularly those who are battling addiction rather than just mental health, addiction, you can feel hopeless. And faith gives you um, a way to kind of see the light. So I think there's certainly a role, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't advocate for a one size fits all. That, that's a very long answer, but um, at least if I were thinking out loud, that's how, how I would kind of uh, maneuver it. I appreciate it. They can play a role of delivering the service, which isn't much different than um, the food pantry, uh, Cleveland Food Bank. It's taxpayer provided, but the churches provide the delivery mechanism because they're they're so deeply rooted into the community, so it, it sounds like a template that can be in other areas. And I will say, from a workforce development perspective, so this is totally separate from kind of the mental health and addiction services. Um, we've towards employment's been doing some work with Cleveland Neighborhood Progress and helping CDCs better understand the workforce development system. And the feedback we get from the CDCs is that residents actually don't feel comfortable going into the kind of established infrastructure for workforce. So they don't feel comfortable going down to downtown to, um, you know, our one through our one stop system, but actually where they are more comfortable seeking services are the churches in they, these like, you know, neighborhood communities. And so if knowing that individuals um, are going to the faith community for services, if they feel like that's the place where they're most connected, then, you know, I believe services should go to where people are. Um, services should meet people rather where they are versus people like having to go all out of their way to seek a service. And so if we know that there's already an audience of individuals seeking help in those venues, then the services should find a way there. Um, and that's where I think the faith community can play a role. Gotcha, thank you. Councilman Miller. Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Addison, thank you very much for stepping up and being willing to serve in this very important role on the Adams Board. I really like your perspective that you just need to have a variety of tools available to people because not everybody is going to be is, is going to respond to the same thing. So I have two questions for you, and the first one is: What other boards and commissions do you currently serve on? So um, this is the first time um, I've been appointed to a uh, a board of this kind. Um, in terms of where I've also had um, kind of a government approval to be on a board, I serve on the Community Advisory Council for NOACA. 
I've always been active in the community in all sorts of capacities, serving on boards. I was on the board of Social Venture Partners Cleveland for a while. I'm currently on the African American Philanthropy Committee of the Cleveland Foundation. I was very active um, on the steering committee of the Solo Philanthropy, which was an exhibit at the Cleveland History Center. That project has kind of come to an end. I just finished uh, grad school. I was in a graduate fellowship called the National Urban Fellowship, which some of you might be familiar with because I believe last year you approved one of my fellow fellows to work in the county under Ted Carter. And um, in finishing that, I stepped away from a few of my obligations with the exception of NOACA's Community Advisory Council and the African-American Philanthropy Committee of the Cleveland Foundation. So those are the two that I stayed on. Um, I'm constantly being asked to sit on committees and strategy groups. So the Cleveland Foundation um, has made an effort uh, with all sorts of foundations and other community stakeholders to develop a rapid response fund for COVID-19. They're moving into phase two and I am on that strategy team. And then through my job, I, I'm a professional uh, committee goer. So um, CIP, the Cleveland Innovation Project, I'm on that steering committee. And for any of those who know me, I am someone that I get my hands dirty. So when they put me on the steering committee, I invited myself to two of the subcommittees so I could know where the work was really happening. And that's just my personal style that I don't like making decisions without having a really broad swath of information from the folks that are actually on the ground doing the work. And so I fully integrate myself into um, kind of the work that I do. So those are the major ones um, and my personal and professional life blend because I'm an advocate. And so I'm an advocate whether um, I'm being paid or not. And so I just, I use my time in such a way where it's like, you know, where is there a need? Where do I have skills that I can make an impact? And um, how do I judiciously do that? Um, and so I think the Adams board complements uh, some of my other activities because I have not been able to be involved in that space professionally, even though I know it has a direct impact on my family and those we serve. And so this board appointment kind of rounds out my, my community activities. So I, I appreciate that answer and hope that you have enough time to effectively serve the Adams board, but uh, it's obvious that you bring a whole lot to the table in terms of organizational intersectionality, the ability to bring all kinds of different viewpoints, people and perspectives to bear to solve community problems. So that's, uh, that's really important. And uh, along that line, my second question is, uh, what do you think that the Adams Board could do to be more effective in serving the reentry community? So uh, in serving the reentry community, I, I don't know that they've always had an emphasis on the reentry community. And some of you might want to push back on that because um, um, in the past, a lot of the Greater Cleveland Reentry Leadership Coalition uh, meetings were held at the Adams Board. Um, Bill, uh, Chief Denahan, um, definitely has a passion, had a passion for reentry when he was serving in the chief capacity. However, um, it always, particularly when uh, we were focused on that work, it always felt like there wasn't an intersectionality between, um, the, the providers that were delivering services around mental health and addiction, and then all the other sectors that intersect with reentry. And because I operate at the intersection of reentry and workforce, I know that the key barriers to individuals returning, it's employment, housing, and, and, and healthcare services. Like those are the three. Like if you don't have that together, then we're not really having a reentry conversation. So I would be interested in better understanding how funding and compliance impacts the way services are delivered and if there are linkage or leverage points that could be flexed that maybe aren't being flexed right now to better connect to other services in the community. So Tours Employment uses the mantra of like right service, right time. And across ecosystems, the, the timing is never right 
And that's how individuals get lost in the shuffle, particularly those that have been, um, because we've had a great conversation um, with Mr. Curry describing all of the, the challenges with what I, I term as criminalization of poverty. Um, so when we think about the bail, cash bail and fees and fines, all of that is just like criminalizing poverty. And those individuals fall through the cracks because those linkages aren't there. And so I would wanna examine that issue. And if there's something I could do about it, I would be an advocate to make those linkages. Um, and you know, if you know me, don't get in my way when I am on a mission. So um, I definitely would make that happen if there's that opportunity. But I have an observation because I'm not on the board yet. Um, I don't want to say my observation is kind of, um, is fact, it's my hunch. I wanna unpack that and better understand whether my hunch is correct. And if it is, then I would look for ways to do something about it. Okay, I think that's a good balance between not wanting to come in like a bull in a china shop, but also being a strong advocate and ready to push to move us forward. So thanks very much. There are no further questions uh, for Ms. Addison. We wanna thank you for uh, coming forward today and I'll make the motion uh, to move this to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Jones this time. Uh, if there are no additional questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, no one is opposed. Thank you, Ms. Addison. And uh, Council Clerk, if you would be so kind, I'd like to have my name added to all three pieces of the uh, legislation put before us today. Okay. And Madam Chair, I would like to do the same. All right. All right. And you can add me too. All right, excellent. Okay, so finally, finally, I'm gonna turn it over to Clerk Bird um, to give us a little, a, a quick intro um, relative to the presentation. We have a presentation up next. It's an update from the Citizens Advisory Council on Equity, um, now known as CASE. Uh, right. <laughs> good morning, council members. It's good to see you. Um, I, of course, am Naila Bird. I am the Cuyahoga County Clerk courts, but I'm here today not in my capacity as clerk, but rather in my role with the Citizen Advisory Council on Equity. The Citizens Advisory Council on Equity and its task was established by county ordinance. The case's duties include, but are not limited to, an examination of both internal and external policies and practices, which enhance equity, inclusion, and access for all. The county's recent resolution declaring racism a public health crisis specifically delineates areas of disparity in healthcare, the criminal justice system, healthy foods, safe and affordable housing, well-paying jobs and business ownership, quality transportation, educational opportunities, and safe places to be active. The resolution directs the case to review focus and present recommendations for elimination of the disparities in these areas and to provide a status report no later than December 31st, 2020. To accomplish this directive in July, the case's 17 members were appointed and their work began. At that time, County Executive Budish asked me to serve as the County Liaison for the case. I worked closely with the chair and committee members to support this very important work. Since August, the case has convened four public meetings, and additionally, there have been regular subcommittee meetings and chair meetings. Most recently, as a part of the process, there have been frequent meetings with numerous county personnel. Pursuant to the resolution declaring racism a public health crisis, the case is to provide regular updates to the executive and county council, including the Human Resources and Appointments and Equity Committee. The case's chair, Eddie Taylor, is here today to present the first of those updates. It is my pleasure to present Mr. Taylor to this committee. Mr. Taylor has provided strong, strong, strong leadership to the case. As you may know, Mr. Taylor is an accomplished entrepreneur and president of Taylor Oswald. He's the current chair of University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center and the immediate past chair of the President's Council, LLC. He also serves as a board member for the Greater Cleveland Sports Commission, Greater Cleveland Partnership, College Now, Ohio Foundation of Independent Colleges, Akron Zoological Park, and the Burton D. Morgan Foundation. 
Eddie, I now turn this portion of the meeting over to you to provide an update on the case's work thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Bird. Uh, three strongs in that introduction. That was, you know, strong, strong, strong. Too, <laughs> strong. That was way too much. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Jordan. for the opportunity to speak to the group. Thank you as well to the council members and others who are in attendance. So uh, that overview was great. So I won't go into a whole lot more detail there other than to say, and I'll attempt to, to abbreviate these comments, other than to say, we've. I want to explain how we've divided the work of CASE, the council, uh, the work that's been done to this point, and then what we hope to be the deliverables, the outcomes. So how we've divided the work, and Naila listed a series of things that we were charged with in order to, to accomplish uh, this work. Uh, through good efforts from some of our committee members, we've divided those 11 or 12 categories or so into four different pillars. The first pillar is what we've called economic opportunity. That is being chaired by Stephen Cavanis. So all the things around jobs and such are in that category. Health and health care, that, that subcommittee is being chaired by Heidi Gallette. And of course, as it sounds, things relative to a healthy population as it deals with these structural racism issues are being chaired there. Quality of life being chaired by Randall McShepard. So we talk about transportation and things that lead to a better quality of life for our citizens and our African-American community in particular. Uh, that work is handled there. Then finally, criminal justice is being chaired by India Pierce Lee. And as it sounds, uh, we have a whole series of issues around the criminal justice system that this subcommittee is exploring. Undergirding all of this effort is a, another subcommittee if you will, on communications, which is being chaired by Phyllis Harris and being ably supported by Eliza Wing inside of uh, the county. So that's the overview of the work that is being undertaken right now. And a series of other things have happened in terms of how we've, we've gone about conducting that work. First, we've had uh, three common ground um, sessions, 600 or so folks in the community signed up to participate in these common ground discussions. Because of some technical difficulties, we were limited to a little less than half of that number who ultimately participated. The great feedback uh, from the community, uh, all of that information has been collated, it has been uh, assembled for the council to review. And ultimately, I think what you'll hear from the community are some of the things that you already know. There are certainly systemic issues, structural issues, how we deal with these things certainly will be the work of the council and the county executive, but good recommendations I believe will, will come forth as a result of that work over time. Then, as Naila mentioned, we've had 21 or so discussions with county personnel and those who may not be in the county on the county uh, payroll ranks, but certainly whose uh, jobs and efforts are affected by the county. That includes, of course, starting with the county executive, Armin Budish, had a, a series of conversations with others, including the chief of staff, Bill Mason, uh, county, I'm sorry, Cleveland Municipal Administrative Judge. Um, Anthony Body has heard earlier, and uh, so many names, including uh, Mr. Bob Corey, who we heard from earlier. So proud of all of those efforts to this point. This afternoon, we're going to meet with Chief Economic Development Officer Ted Carter, and the following inter interviews are also scheduled. Executive Director of the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County Deputy Chief, Sheriff, uh, Deputy Chief Sheriff Brian Smith, Director of Cuyahoga County Personnel Review Commission, uh, Rebecca Kapsinski, and then we are going to have additional meetings with folks who have expressed such a great interest in advising or offering their services and input to this effort. I'm quite honestly overwhelmed in so many respects with how the citizens and those who believe this is such an important endeavor to take the time to offer assist in any way that, they, that we deem possible. So those conversations continue. Another component of the work is the systems, map, uh, systems mapping work. This is a big and sometimes overwhelming uh, project. What we've attempted to do is try to break it down in pieces to show the interactive interactivity between criminal justice and quality of life and all the other components that we're looking at. Uh, Dr. St uh, Peter Hobman from Case Western Reserve has offered his time uh, in a gratis way to assist in creating this map so that we can all speak the same language around issues uh, surrounding uh, structural racism. And then finally, uh, we are going to put live on the a communication survey so that anyone else who has thoughts or opinions from the community on this work, this effort can weigh in. And then I would say uh, the 
um, <clears throat> the what we owe to the county council ultimately is this interim report that Clerk Bird spoke of. We've given ourselves, uh, of course, through the end of uh, the year, but we hope to have something to you, uh, Councilwoman uh, Brown and others. Um, let's call it middle of, of, of December. Work is already underway in terms of the writing, but we're asking you to all understand that this is a, a first step, almost preliminary in some ways. It won't be fully developed. We will give you an update on all that we've heard, what's occurred, our initial findings, some initial thoughts, recommendations may even be forthcoming in that report, but it won't be the final product. We know this um, council uh, will endure beyond December 31st of 2020, uh, given the legislation enacted, but we want this first opportunity to present to you what we've uncovered to be a great starting point. With that, if there are any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I do thank you and appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, I was jotting down lots of notes because, you know, this is a very, very, very uh, personal for me. And so I, I've been in conversations. I had the privilege to partake in a couple of the meetings that you um, put. Some of the questions that I have relative, um, you, you touched on, um, you touched on the personnel that you've met with and out of the out of respect for time, unless someone here um, would like to know that extensive list, if you could just provide that to our clerk, a couple of things I hope that you can provide for us. So the personnel um, members that you have met with and the ones you intend to met with, you did touch on Ted Carter and Brian Smith. Um, you also mentioned additional meetings from the public inviting um, with Case Western Reserve lending their services. Can you touch on any other um, meetings that you have planned in the future for that uh, that have been willing um, to share their experiences? We, we've had a few, uh, which include uh, folks from across the, the state of Ohio, quite honestly, a, a group um, called the Collective for the State of Ohio. I believe it, the origins, and I will correct me if I'm wrong, um, are through the, the NAACP. Uh, or the, the chapter leads for the NAACP across the state. Good conversations there. Um, and we're trying to figure out how, how to sort of uh, co-join the work, uh, if at all possible. We've had uh, good discussions with folks within CMHA um, in, in terms of uh, the personnel there who don't, who haven't uh, minded being um, noted as participants in this process. More to come, uh, but as it turns out, once or twice a week right now, we're getting inquiries from individuals who, who have asked to um, participate or be interviewed in some ways. If they're specific names, perhaps Naila ha has them, but um, that continues. Okay. Sure, I, I can add a few, uh, Councilwoman Brown. We, um, Eddie and I have spoken to, as he mentioned, the folks from the uh, collaborative. We have also spoken um, with Glenn Shoemate. Do you remember him? Um, we spoke to Victor McDowell from CMHA. We are scheduled to speak with, which I will, I will get you the, I'll get your clerk the list of interview folks, I'm sure. If my chief of staff is listening, she's probably sent it already um, to her. But we're meeting with the, um, the woman from Legal Aid. We've met with uh, the head of the YAA, the y YWCA. Um, I think that's Eddie. Can I, who am I leaving out? I, I think we, we can get you the, the yeah. complete list. I uh, just wanted yeah. you to hear some names. You know, that, that may not have been a question that you were anticipating. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the other thing I would like to know, hopefully you can share with us, you touched on a survey um, that will be available to the public. Um, so just curious how we intend to um, get that out into the public and who would be um, managing the data and have we, have we already prepared that um, survey as far as the type of questions that will be included or what does the survey look like? I'm, I'm kind of excited about the survey. Right, it's a, it's a work in process, progress certainly. Um, and if you'd like to see the questions before they go live, certainly we can, we can deal with that. But there are two components as far as I'm concerned. One, and certainly I would seek the approval from um, this committee uh, or at least uh, the support. The, the first is once we complete our report that will go to the public, first to you and the county executive and then to the public, I'd like for the community to 
offer their thoughts with respect to that work. So we wanna create a vehicle, a method for the community to respond to what we've put out in space in some ways. So that's the first piece. The survey questions uh, might be in some ways related, but I would say to you, um, how it's communicated will be dealt with through uh, Clerk Bird's office and, and Eliza Wing's office. Um, so more to come on that one. As I said, it's in development right now. But those two components in so many ways related, I think are important ingredients in terms of what this thing ultimately looks like for us. Okay, and then the, my last thing, and then I'll open it up to my colleagues, is uh, the disparity study. I know that you all received the, um, the copy of the disparity study, and um, I cannot overstate my enthusiasm around the findings, uh, the legal findings of number nine, which um, legally give us the authority to um, have gender and race specific uh, legislation to address some of the, the inequities that have uh, been long standing and, and way too prevalent in, in Cuyahoga County. So um, I would encourage if you haven't already to explore um, to explore the disparity studies, the recommendations included in it, but to really um, really hone in on that on that findings because it does put us in a position that I don't think that we've been in um, before as a county and I and I had a I've had conversations with individuals who have heard we've done disparity studies in the past you know this isn't the first disparity study in fact this is the second one um, that I was a part of since becoming a member of the council so I want to really elevate our um, citizens' confidence that this disparity study will be different from those they may have experienced in the past um, because it does give us a firmer footing to be able to um, do what may have, been, have historically known as set aside. So I would just encourage this body to really, really um, look at that and um, put forth uh, recommendations that would that would um, dream big, <laughs> as I'll say, dream big and, and be aggressive um, because I, I, I think this is a, a prime opportunity to be able to address some of the equity issues that have been um, plaguing, plaguing particularly black people and contracting in this uh, county for a very long time. So with that said, I will open it up to my colleagues if they have I'll, I'll interpret that as, as marching orders. So the answer is yes, we will dream big. So thank you for those. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, Council, Councilman Miller. So uh, I have have two comments and a question. The uh, the first comment is, is regarding the online survey, which uh, I'm also excited about. And I would just like to encourage you to uh, to go to the uh, the website relating to the NOACA's uh, uh, 2050 project. Uh, you can go to ENEO 2050. www.eneo2050, and I think it's. It, it's .org or .com, I forget. But anyway, they have a tool called CrowdGage. And uh, it's better than a survey. It's, it's an interactive tool where you choose among priorities and, and you uh, do resource allocations and you get information on potential impacts. And, and uh, so I would... I would just suggest that you go take a look at it and, and see if see if anything somewhat like that might be useful for your for your survey planning. So that's the first comment. The second comment is about the disparity study. And uh, I looked at it and uh, and yes, they uh, they recommended that there's legal foundation. To, uh, to do race and gender conscious uh, programming for Cuyahoga County. And then the sp specific set of recommendations that I thought that they offered, I thought were relatively mild. And so uh, I would be very interested in the uh, 
commission's uh, uh, recommendations as to whether what the uh, disparity study recommended is strong enough or whether you would recommend that stronger action be taken. So, uh, so that's the second comment. And the question I have is if you would just uh, describe what you see as the, uh, the intersection and the coordination and the relationship among uh, uh, your Citizens Advisory Commission and, uh, and three other bodies that we have related to this subject, namely the county's Equity Commission, secondly, the, uh, the Disparity Commission, which was set up as an advisory body following the last disparity study, and thirdly, the Human Rights Commission. Well, I, I'm not familiar with all of the various uh, commissions, but we have established a, a pretty good working relationship. As a matter of fact, Ted Carter and others on staff met with, um, with me and uh, Naila and the team uh, recently. We talked about ways to work together and some of the commitments that we made to one another, hopefully, and Jesse Drucker is aware of this as well. Those commitments hopefully will produce um, a product by at least these two councils and commissions, which is honest, which dreams big, as mentioned, and lays bare, as I heard earlier, all the concerns, but hopefully will produce the kinds of recommendations that are, that are actionable for the county, uh, not only for the work internally, but how we, we move this, these thoughts and these recommendations outwardly to the community. So more to come on that one. I would say it is a good relationship because we had a solid relationships with these individuals before this work started. But as much as anything else, I'm impressed with the candor that everyone we believe uh, has provided to this point. Not everything has been pleasant. Not all the conversations have been what we, we might have thought going in. There are individuals who have made it plain, made it clear that the issues around structural and systemic racism are there, that they are evident, that they should be done away with and as quickly as humanly possible. So that for me, while we knew this to be true uh, from a, um, a theoretical standpoint, it's great that individuals both um, of color and, and not of color who have said the same things on a consistent basis. Uh, with respect to um, the disparity study, our, everyone on the council has the study to this point. Um, we have time scheduled over the next couple of weeks to dig into this um, uh, deeper, and we will have hopefully informed and robust conversations around how this interacts with the work that we're doing. It has to, we know it has to, of course. Um, what we articulate uh, in our first report to you, um, based upon the input from the study, uh, is to be determined. Thank you. Any other questions? Madam Chair? Thank you. And uh, I'd just like to comment again on the disparity study. And I encourage you, just as the chair, chairwoman has said, dream big. Uh, go through it. Uh, make your, de your determinations and, and your recommendations. Uh, and, and also keep in mind that this disparity study legislation was rooted in one simple thought. It, it was that this county shall conduct a disparity study once every four years. It didn't say may, it didn't say best faith effort, it said shall. This will happen every four years. So because of that, we had the long game to be played and that long game can bring change today and you may be able to bring it all today. And then in the future, we will work to maintain it. Or if, if you, you feel you haven't gotten everything, then still in four years, we're coming back. So we will take the temperature or the, the check the health of this county on a consistent basis forever. And as things need to be changed, we will be able to do it. Because we did not introduce race conscious four years ago, and I really wanted to, but yeah. because we didn't, four years went by so fast. I didn't seem like four years would go by that fast. And now we're on even firmer footing to do race conscious and gender conscious um, uh, action items 
today than we were four years ago. The reality is people have been suing across this country and, and suing successfully against governments who have uh, introduced race conscious legislation. I think we're on firm footing to do so today after all the work we've done over the past four years. So uh, with that, again, I encourage you as our chairwoman has said to, to dream big and, and, and do all that you can to continue to move this county forward. Thank, Thank you, you Councilman, Councilman Jones. Jones. All right. Well, I um, I I, I thank you uh, both uh, for the work that you've been doing in leading this charge, um, Mr. Taylor and Ms. Bird. The work is we know it is it is not easy. It is challenging. It is uh, laborious. <laughs> it is uh, it is many many things, but it but of all of those things. It is necessary. It is necessary. And it is necessary at this time, and it is necessary um, if we are going to improve the conditions of the county as a whole when it comes to the economy, um, jobs, education, the four, the four pillars that you so, uh, so um, well identified combining those uh, data points that were important to me to be able to arm whomever would inherit this legislation to be in a position to make, um, to make demands, quite frankly, for the needs that have been um, left void for so long. So I just want to thank you sincerely for the work and the time that you put in and um, know that this is valuable. I think I speak on behalf of, of the council and our staff. Um, we cannot overstate our appreciation for the work that you are doing and um, encourage you to be encouraged as you, as you continue to do this heavy lifting for us and know that you have the full support of this um, body behind you. So um, if nothing else is, uh, if there's nothing else and all minds and hearts and heads are clear, if any of my, unless my colleagues have any miscellaneous uh, reports, I think we are at a place where we can conclude this meeting and, and come to a place of adjournment. Um, are there any other comments, questions, or concerns? All right, excellent. Nope. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate you so, so very much. Have a wonderful day. Try to stay warm and uh, dry. We've got our first snowfall. So welcome to Cleveland. <laughs> All right, take care.